Welcome to the 23rd episode of Speaking of Poetry. I am Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured in this series. I am delighted to be joined today by Anne McGee DeShell. Anne has for many years been a full-time professor of reading and language arts in the Quinnipiac University School of Education, training teachers to promote the power of the written word in their classrooms. She has always had a passion for social justice in education and for providing all children with the opportunity to be taught by talented and compassionate teachers. With that in mind, she worked her way through college and graduate school, she holds a PhD from UConn, by teaching reading and writing to disadvantaged children. In 1997, she founded, along with five other teachers, a charter school in South Norwalk, Connecticut, of which she is currently chair of the board and to which she is traveling today. <laughs> her passion has also led her to write several children's books. Recently, her lifelong love of poetry has been bolstered by involvement in writing groups, including one led by Marge Piercy. Earlier this year, Antrim House published her first book of poems, Waiting for Wisdom. That title, which springs from Anne's most becoming modesty, belies her true character, for she is one of the wisest poets I know. We are indeed fortunate to have, to have her here up from New Haven to read to us today. Welcome to Speaking of Poetry and the show. Thanks, Rennie, so much for that lovely introduction. Um, as you noted, this is my first uh, poetry publication, and I really want to thank you especially for guiding me and being so kind uh, and such a wonderful editor. It really taught me a great deal, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you've been a very kind and generous teacher. Um, I find it difficult, actually, to prepare for this taping. Uh, I really don't believe that poetry should be unpacked so much. Um, I love, there's an old story of a master and a teacher, and the, uh, the master says, the, the students say to the master, you tell us stories, but you never explain them. And the master says, how would you like it if I offered you fruit, but before I gave it to you, it was chewed up. <laughs> um, so I feel that way about poetry a little bit. So I really just want to give some background as to why I wrote some of these poems, uh, why I stopped being a closet poet, because I used to just write them and then put them in the drawer. Um, and after the workshop with Marge Piercy, she was adamant that one of the things you really need to do if you're serious about your poetry is get it out there. And so um, I, this is a huge step for me, but I really want to get it out there. So I'd like to start with a poem that actually is the first poem I ever read in an, a public reading. Um, it was done after the PRC workshop, so it was only about a year ago, so I haven't done too many readings. But it also talks about uh, getting your story out there. It's called Who Will Unpack? Who will unpack the suitcase of your life? Some minister, minutes before the service, asking the family, tell me about her. A son or a daughter who cannot help but see you through a dim microscope, unfocused, too close. The stories that matter rarely make the eulogy. Who will unpack the suitcase of your life? Old age bends the spine with stories left untold. Release the locks, unzip the compartments, give everything away. Hold up each garment, creased perhaps, stored in the folds of your heart. Smile at your audience, no matter who, and begin. So that was actually the very first poem I ever read <laughs> to an audience. And I think it speaks to the fact that we all have stories. Um, and those stories are really important to share. The, first, the second poem that I'd like to read is called Postpartum 1955. And this poem is really part of my story. Um, my mother suffered greatly from clinical depression. And 
uh, at the time, in the 50s, it was not well understood. And so this is just a little reference to uh, understanding a little bit the stigma of that time frame and uh, depression. Postpartum 1955. Clenching her rosary beads, she kneels by the bed, leaving my newborn self wailing. Chubby fists, sweaty black curls, smeared flat against the small globe of skull. They carry her away, a mother who forgets why her breasts have swollen, eyes deadened, limbs limp and lifeless, wrapped tightly in white sheets, tucked into the back of an ambulance like a broken doll blanketed in tissue paper, hidden away in an attic box. My father is unable to hold me, fearing I will shatter, my fragile newness magnified by the calloused palms and thick fingers of a simple man. An aunt disperses us to temporary arms, sisters to the north, a brother south. Now a fondling, I am passed to others who cluck their tongues and shake their heads, the tiny circle of eyes and mouth visible only through the tight infant wrappings meant to secure, mirroring so closely the mother now also swaddled in her own crib bed somewhere. Months later, she returns, a shadow haunting an upstairs bedroom, a glimpse of nightgown, a solemn gaze of non-recognition and longing. The vague emptiness seeps into my infant soul, taking root there, living now always, if, if, as if somehow, I am to blame. That tragedy of mental illness um, that my mother had also uh, speaks to the tragedy of the people around, the people who have mental illness. And so this next poem I want to read really speaks more to the people who are affected by and living with someone who has uh, depression, and it's called Depression is Not Sadness. The flatness of your voice does not reveal the relentless spinning of your thoughts. Your fear is like whirring, wooding tops that skitter and bounce, gaining momentum, not held in check, not held in, not held, hell. Wanting to pull you back like Orpheus descending, do I venture into Hades? I cannot sing. Depression is not sadness, but distortion. Grief without death, pain without wound, sleep without rest. You hold your head in your hands, and nearby I weep and wait, silently begging Serbius, the guardian of the gate, to let me pass, to let me plead for your return. As you might guess, I, uh, I grew up in a large Irish family, actually, and as you might guess, with a mother who had some serious illnesses, and I also had a brother who was very ill, uh, a blue-collar dad. We had very little in the way of material things. Um, and this next poem is really a kind of gesture of gratitude to Pablo Neruda, whose poetry I love and whose wonderful ode to my socks inspired me to remember that poems not, need not always be aiming towards the abstract, um, but often the deepest significance is in small things. And so, in reference to Ode to My Socks, this poem of mine is simply called Socks. Let me find it here. Socks. Ah, new socks. Toes dipping into the soft that stretches luxuriously, molding itself tightly to each curve of arch, ankle, calf. In my neighborhood, socks were orphaned commodities, sad, unmatched, scratchy, faded and without elasticity. You battled always the slide down the back of your heel, the bunch at your ankles, 
bandaging them over the edge of your toes while inching into worn shoes, trying to keep the holes from catching you painfully in a game of tag. A slight thing, new socks, and still I love them. Um, as I noted before, this is my first book of poems. And although I've been writing poems for a number of years behind closed doors and, as I said, stuffing them into drawers, um, it was not until I was after 50, after 50 years, that I began to seriously realize that I needed to do more than stuff these in a drawer. So this next poem is called After 50, which was for me um, a real turning point, I think, in my own life in the sense of learning to live my life more authentically, not being afraid to finally be on something like this and, and read um, after 50. The people I love now, the ones I want to be with, are those of the light, not moaners. They do not pretend to be more or less than who they are. They laugh much. They know God. My foot starts tapping at falsehoods in braggadocio. I feign politeness, trying to find what I can in the discomfort of it, but mostly wanting to go home, pluck around on the piano, watch the sparrow out my front window. Uh, a lot of this book is about this age of being after 50. Um, the kind of youth culture I think we have today. I think most Americans find it difficult simply to be 50, uh, to be an elder. Um, I like the concept of elders, um, and I want to be able to help people and guide youth rather than myself continuously try to be young. Um, our priorities change, and so this poem really speaks to m my uh, respect for the elder of the community and why it's so important. It's called Gift of the Elder. In stillness, she watches from her perch by the railing, a tiny bird, a vigil candle keeping the flame. The children, aimlessly running through the steamy summer dusk, eat out, eke out a final hour of play. Jubilant shrieks cutting the solid heat, a hot knife through butter. All the games of childhood that matter so much and not at all. Her porch is a rest stop for teenage girls who wear more pride than clothes, younger boys who fear needing to be strong. Their breath slows in the presence of her rhythms, enveloped by her faint sense of lilac soap and kindness. To each, she reaches out, the skin of her long fingers like parchment, patting with assurance the tender discomfort of being young. Again, a lot of Waiting for Wisdom is about the turning point of aging. And this next poem is really a favorite of mine. Um, and it's a favorite because, well, it's the different perspective you have as, it, uh, have as you gain age and you start to think more broadly. And it's called Bucket to Shoulder. Most days I can forget that I am not long for this world but night's tender fingers now wrap often round my throat. I tremble in darkness, choking on the question, has any of it mattered? I miss the timelessness of youth, wasting days as thoughtlessly as running the faucet while brushing my teeth, unaware of millions who trek miles, bucket to shoulder, just to survive another day. Now they are with me always. I see them walking, walking, calloused souls, rusted pails filled as they return to their lives and I to mine, together and alone, heavy burdened. Again, I think 
Aging is often a series of losses, watching your parents die, uh, cleaning out their apartments, recognizing yourself that you're on short time. So the next few poems that I'd like to read are about those experiences. The first one is called Hurricane. As a child, I witnessed a hurricane. The nearby beach where we played became furious pounding surf so thunderous vibrations shook my house. I stood with my father, yellow rubber raincoat slapping loudly, exhilarated by salt taste winds that, strung, that stung my face, while Neptune sucked into his belly all the ocean he could hold, hurling rocks against the, against the cement retaining wall, shattering them like crystal, spewing over and over seaweed Stones, sea, such a huge display, I could not move from it. Crying out when my father suddenly clutched me to his chest and rushed me home in his arms. Years later, the gasping and heaving of my father's dying brought back that day as his gnarled and blue-veined hands reached for the little girl in me. I was, in his last moments, as on the day of that hurricane, compelled to watch in fear and awe a power I did not understand. No one carried me home. Um, this next poem is called Newell Post. Um, as I said before, we I grew up in a, a very large Irish family and we didn't have a lot, but there was a a lovely staircase in our old home, and um, it, it became a special point in our family photos, and it was a place where we hung out because it was probably the prettiest thing in the house. So it's called Newell Post. Like a sentry guard, ornate and stoic, the Newell Post stood in the entry hall of my childhood home. White swirled base like soft serve ice cream, fat and thick, squarely topped with a mortarboard of deep mahogany, erect in classic beauty. Precariously as toddlers, we climbed this urban tree, throwing our coats over it in winter, turning our backs to it as teenagers, leaning into its solid presence while wrapping the phone cord round its base, whispering to boys who did not speak flaunting its grandeur for wedding photos and prom, pretending a home more rich, a life more elegant. Later, longing to huddle again at its base, sharing stories with this witness of vigilant wood. Um, this next poem is called These Years. These Years. Only these. No other century, no other country, no other. Ancestors did not know the you their living created, as you do not know how these days will matter, but they will. These years, only these. No joy to waste, no moment to ignore. Glance with benevolence at each encounter. For eternity has placed you, only you, in these years, only these. I spoke before about getting older and uh, how I really didn't even begin to do any poetry until after 50, seriously. Um, and now, nearing 60, <laughs> um, this poem is really uh, speaking to uh, what is titled, The Death of Urgency. <laughs> Nearing 60, slowing to a rhythm that suits me, languorous, unwanting. A quiet sway, a hammock hung from a willow tree, the long tresses of branch, my Medusa, only kind, this one. Hiding me in her great mane, she lets me nap, sheltered by her weeping, sharing her wisdom. Rest, listen, 
cradle babies, tell the truth, embrace all who allow it, stay close to water, and come to the willows now and again. The next one is apartment, and again it speaks to the loss when uh, parents die. Apartment. Four days ago they said you would die tomorrow, but you, you took them on. Car mechanics, inept waiters, high school checkout girls who absently overcharge your groceries, doctors. Death, life could never cheat you. Heart undaunted, pulsing against collapsed veins, you left us hapless guards at the rails of your bed. Alone now, I silently survey what remains on your kitchen counter. Tuna fish cans, clean and dry, inverted by your sink. Glasses you had touched. Dishcloths you had folded. A life of small habits expecting your return. Your soapy scent fills each closet, each dress a story. I unearth a jacket, price tags dangling from the sleeve, sadly waiting as a shy girl at a dance, never to be chosen. Drawers that hide the forgotten scraps of daily living, grocery lists for sausages and batteries, phone numbers random and unfamiliar, recipes and reminders scribbled unknowingly as artifacts I cannot throw away. Diligent all day to finish unraveling the regrets. I sort your life into cartons and garbage cans. Finally, sealing your keys in an envelope, scrawling thank you on the front to leave on the now emptied counter. Aware a time will come when I will work to remember the sound of your voice or the color of these kitchen walls. The last one that I want to read on this sort of topic is watching the tulips, um, considering my own dying. I think. Watching the tulips. Through a steamy haze of early coffee and already too much Monday, watching their cupped faces lean towards the breaking sun, sensing warmth, each opens slightly with a delicacy that both calms and saddens. Fragile stamens exposed, the black stars of their deepest selves dusted with orange pollen as if flavored by some rare spice. By week's end, a few have tired, drooping low, bowed in humility, relinquishing with quiet grace their time of flourish. Others refuse, edges browning, disassembling petal by petal, rotting and embittered, which dying will be mine? I gather their remains into the garbage can. By now you might be thinking, God, is she depressing? Um, <laughs> death, dying, depression. The only thing she likes is socks. Um, but honestly, I am really a very, very happy person, happier than I've been in a long time. And I think the happiness comes from um, the ability to, as we age, really um, live our lives authentically, um, not polishing up or pretending, uh, accepting the sorrows, um, accepting the sadnesses or the losses, not trying to um, pad them with any kind of false pretense. And so one of the poems that I particularly like, one that um, Rennie suggested I use is the final poem, uh, in the book is called As Evening Approaches and it's really about the ability to uh, sort of take in all that life offers. Loneliness is the worst best thing. Saturday nights on the couch, weddings at the back table, sitting all night with great aunts in wheelchairs, sinking into the sadness until even breathing seems an effort listening for your own pulse, assuring you have not died. Only when your bones ache from sitting this one out, no longer able to roam each room of the house, 
memories clutched in your hands like playing cards, shuffling through exquisite minor moments lost to all but you. Do you invite aloneness to come in, find a comfortable chair, and sit? There won't be much to say at first, but over time, a space begins to open for something larger than your small life. So you light a fire, sip a scotch, savor that at least this night you have not run from what is, and shyness, finally, asking yourself to dance. Finally, um, I'd like to end with a poem that Rennie actually suggested as a prologue to Waiting for Wisdom. Um, but I think is a good way, perhaps, to end this taping. Uh, because it's a poem about taking risks. Um, a lot of people have read this poem um, and have thought of it as something of a feminist poem, but I really didn't intend for it to be that. It really is more, in my mind, about uh, being in even an ideal situation and still deciding to make a decision to perhaps look for more um, or to step out. And so um, this one, which is the prologue of the book, is called Eve. Woman ate first of the apple, not in disobedience, but intuitively aware that paradise was not all it was cracked up to be. Happy blandness, life without woe or wonder. Adam may still be watching ball games on Sunday afternoons, but as for Eve, she needs to write poems. And thank you for that delicious reading, uh, which uh, had only fresh fruit, uh, nothing chewed, <laughs> uh, entirely delicious. Thank and, you. Uh, although this may have been one of your first readings, uh, it was a, a, a glorious reading. I love the way you unpacked the bag of your life for us, uh, holding up uh, the truth, uh, the joys, uh, and not omitting the sorrows, uh, and certainly showing that the uh, title of the book uh, belies the wisdom of your, uh, oh, thank you. of your poetry and of yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and thanks to uh, Ken Picard and Karen Hanville, who make this program possible. If you would like to learn more about Anne Duchel and read samples from her book, please visit the Antrim House website, antrimhousebooks.com. You may also be interested in other Antrim House poets whose lives and works are described on the website. Goodbye for now until we meet again next month for the 24th installment, impossibly, of Speaking of Poetry.